Hi, and welcome to setting up the open source LMS in the cloud. Uh, this is a two-part uh, series. Uh, the first part will just uh, give you some background information as to uh, what cloud is and uh, how it works and why you would even want to do this. Um, a lot of times I find that people um, have heard of Lingo and kind of know about what it is, but maybe are not exactly 100% sure on, as to why you would want to do that. Um, the why is certainly important as well. Uh, and this is Patrick, uh, by the way. So um, let's get started here. Um, so why would you want to set up your, your learning infrastructure in the cloud? That would be the main question. So in order to answer that, let's uh, go back and look at the exactly what the problem is. What is the what is the pain that we're trying to solve here? So traditionally, what we've had in the past is one person or a group of people would be accessing one server, and uh, this this worked uh, pretty well. And in fact, most of the hosting um, services that are out there are set up this way. Um, the issue with this is that you that there was a single point of failure. And so if this server were to go down or became uh, or went uh, on over capacity, um, you would see a lot of degradation in the services that it's providing. So in order to get work around this, what we started doing was adding additional servers. So uh, in order to handle load and uh, provide the redundancy, we have now two servers. So since the redundant server is basically uh, just waiting for some for the primary server to go down, um, we decided to start sending uh, users to it, providing a faster service. Uh, but in a sense that we've now we've created two places, or we've doubled our chances of um, failure. Now there's probably going to be a load balancer of some sort in front of it. It'll be able to detect whether one server went down or not, uh, and then send the rest of the traffic uh, to the other server. And this and this works as long as everything is sized correctly. So the, the one server will be able to handle the load at that particular time um, for that amount of students. So then we went into the cloud after that. So as you see, there's more and more servers. So we started distributing each of the components of the server out to different section, other different servers. So, for instance, you may have the file storage piece, the uh, uh, tra uh, traffic uh, distribution uh, node or router. Uh, there may be a database server, and there may be a uh, front end web server. And uh, so now, um, again. Now we're uh, becoming. Uh, now we have more redundancy um, that are that is required because now we have more points of failure. Uh, but if you look at the shape of the um, servers, uh, it's starting to look a little bit like a cloud, and so that's why they call it cloud services. Um, so really, what what is cloud services? It's uh, I guess a group. Or a cluster of uh, computers all working together in order to provide uh, the student uh, a uh, e-learning experience. So why would you want to do that? I mean, it seems like a lot of complexity. If you keep the the one server and the database on that one server, uh, now you have a, you do have a single point of failure, but Server hardware is very reliable, and so the failure rate is is less than 0.99999% uh, in most cases, um, and um, it, it seems to add a lot of complexity uh, having all these servers and then having the route to the right server. And of course, there's firewall rules that need to be set up so that servers can all talk to each other. Um, it, it starts getting a little complicated. <clears throat> so the main um, advantage for adding this complexity, and and it could be because you're adding this complexity anyway, is that as you get up 
and to higher uh, number of students, uh, you're going to see a, a big slowdown, right? So if you see it, if we have 300 people that are all accessing this one server at the same time, the server is uh, not going to be able to handle that load. And so we have to add a second server anyway. And now we uh, distribute the load for the additional 300 people. So now we have approximately 600 people that are able to access our servers at, at any one time. Um, so this is great, right? We could just uh, do this forever. Just keep adding servers after server after server. Um, until our capacity is up uh, as high as we need it to be. Um, but what happens uh, at the end of the day? All your students will go home and they're not going to be taking training anymore um, unless they train at night, of course. And so you have these two uh, servers that are sitting around uh, not really doing anything. Uh, the one primary server, he may be serving a few requests every once in a while. But certainly nowhere close to the, the big load during the day. And uh, a second server may not even be hit at all, all night long. And so they, uh, uh, so you have a, all this capacity that's sitting there. Um, so a good example would be a, uh, a 12 lane highway, uh, at the middle, in the middle of the night. Um, no one needs that. Um, that's way more capacity, but these, um, these roads are being built uh, in order to handle the, the maximum capacity during the day. And uh, as you see with the traffic jams, they're usually under capacity. So this is the, the same situation. We want just the right amount of capacity for any given time. So the, one of the main concepts uh, that you should um, understand uh, is the uh, concept of virtualization. And uh, that's how uh, cloud computing is able to fix this problem with capacity. Um, and so what, what is, what the heck is a, is uh, virtualization? So if you can imagine an operating system, it's just, uh, if you go to your C drive, you can see the operating system there. It's, it's just a collection of files. Um, so what we can do is create an image of that operating system. Uh, and make it into one single file. And then that single file can be moved from your existing machine to another machine and, and then even copied because now it's just one file. Um, it's a special file in the sense that the op entire operating system lives within this single file. Um, and then, um, and then specialized software can run this and turn it back into an ex a running server. So a virtual, uh, we call them virtual servers, and they can be started at any time uh, on any machine. So what's the difference between a virtual and a not virtual? Um, on the left there, we have the virtual server, and the right is the actual server hardware running an operating system. Uh, the truth is there's really not that much difference other than all the operating system files and the entire sys uh, virtual server has been contained into one image or one, um, one file, and it's being run from that one file, where on, in the actual server hardware on the right there, it's being run in the traditional sense where the operating system is installed onto the physical disk, onto the computer, and then it's run from there, like a normal one. So that's, that's the main, that would be the main difference there. So, what that lets us do is we can distribute that virtual image to any of these machines here. And what that lets us do is instead of creating uh, new creating new hardware every time we need to increase our capacity, we could copy this virtual server to any of the actual servers that are already out there and then students can access that directly. This person seems to be accessing this person with this arrow. I'm not sure how that happened, but um, I don't think that's correct there. Now, what's uh, one of the great benefits of being able to stand up and uh, set up virtual servers anywhere 
is you can do it anywhere that you have students. And so as long as there is a hardware in that area, you can copy that virtual image to that server and uh, start it up and then students can access that. And this is great for, um, for uh, geographically distributed um, e-learning. Um, this is the problem here where if you have a centralized server, each of the people would be accessing that central server. And so if you're far away, uh, i.e. not in North America, then you're going to notice a lot of lag and a lot of uh, slowdowns in order to access that. We solve that by creating virtual servers in each of the locations close to the main uh, population that you're, that you're serving. So what, why would you, why would you not want to do this? Uh, it does add a lot of complexity. Um, perhaps you have a very small defined audience already, uh, a couple of hundred people, maybe less than a thousand. Uh, maybe the people normally go to the server at the same random times, uh, 24 hours a day. And so the load stays very, very low on the, on the server. You don't have a lot of big, uh, spikes in, uh, traffic. Um, you're not gonna, you're not expecting a lot of growth, right? You're not expecting to have to add a lot of servers in the future. And then finally, there's a cost. Uh, most, uh, cloud services charge by the hour. Um, and so you're renting, you're renting this hardware and software, basically CPU cycles by the hour. And so, uh, one thing that's interesting is, uh, it kind of goes back to this whole, uh, mainframe mentality that was around, uh, in the sixties where you had shared computing platforms. And so what's, what's old is now new again. Um, so who offers, uh, cloud hosting and how, how would you uh, go about getting that? Um, this is just a list of a few of the companies. Uh, they, uh, they all seem to be fairly competitive uh, with each other um, and uh, with a few offering more, more specialized um, solutions. This will be the end of the uh, part one. Um, you see the part two, uh, we're going to actually set up a Moodle instance in uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, so thank you very much for listening and have a good day.